everybody, I'm Jennifer. Welcome back. And I thought I'd come on today and address a couple questions that have come up um, in my Instagram feed from some folks. I've also had a couple emails from some people. It's certainly something that's always on my mind, and I think it's something that really most of us uh, going through benzo withdrawal um, have to address at some point. Um, and it, it can be really, it can leave us feeling very unclear as to how to do so. And in essence, it's it's kind of how do we begin to reacclimate back into our lives um, when we've gone through something um, as kind of horrific as benzo withdrawal. And I just don't think there's an easy way to answer that question. Um, you know, here's more good news, right? More more uncertainty. Here's some, you know, here's another nonlinear path to take, right? Um, I think at this point we're so starved for somebody just to kind of show us the way, but. I think why this is a hard question to answer is because because the 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 degree of variability in this from severity to the types of symptoms you know some people just primarily have mental symptoms some primarily just have physical symptoms many people have a kind of a combo platter of both um, I myself tend to have primarily mental symptoms but certainly have the two or three or four pretty distressing physical symptoms that can pop up and be somewhat debilitating. And so this, this idea of how do we begin to enter back into our lives and when do we do that and how do we do that? And again, I'm going to just take a stab at this and, and just speak, um, you know, my disclaimer that I am a clinician, but I'm not serving as a clinician in these videos. I'm, I'm simply just trying to provide my own two cents and my own experience. Um, but again, with the variability of severity and the variability of the symptom presentation, the, the variability of what we have lost, um, um, you know, for some of us, we've found benzo buddies and we've, we've caught on to the game of what's happened to us early on where we can kind of wrangle hold of a good taper plan and recognize what's going on and maybe the damage hasn't been quite as significant for other people. You know, maybe they're, you know, maybe you're, you're bed bound or you're house bound. Um, you've been unable to work. You know, again, we, we, we have the whole bandwidth um, and it's huge. Um, so I just want to stop for a second and I am in just some different surroundings. So if you see me, you know, this crowded uh, sports room behind me, I'm actually visiting family, and this is one of my brothers. Um, he's obviously a sports fanatic, and so this is one of his rooms. Um, but I wanted to come on and speak to this because I also um, am out of my small town of Brenham for a little while, and I have a little bit better access to Wi-Fi, so I thought I'd record while I was here. Let's get back to this, though. So how do we know? And I, I think, you know, I always talk about, you know, the idea of balancing, um, you know, the wisdom is really knowing what you can control and what you can't control. Okay. And I think wisdom in benzo withdrawal is also that constant balancing act of what's possible and what just is not possible in this moment. And I think sometimes we have to try things on, not just sometimes, because we don't really have any guides in this, other than the thousands of people that came before us who are trying to help us get through this, um, the benzo coaches that are sticking around, people that are going online and giving videos, those types of things. Um, we don't really have a formula, right, of, of how to navigate this and what to expect. And so, so much of what we're doing in our withdrawal, whether it's in tapering or post-tapering or however we've landed on or off these meds, has been through trial and error. And that is really how I think we think about going back into our lives as well. Um, you know, I talk a lot about Claire Weeks, and Claire Weeks would talk about, you know, that, that, that the strength of the injured limb would depend upon the confidence with which we kind of practice using it. I'm butchering her words, but in essence, she was talking about, you know, if you've gone in for a hip surgery and had a hip replacement um, and were, you know, stuck in a chair for two weeks, um, and then you, you know, had to go through, you know, six months of physical therapy to learn how to walk with this new hip. Had you sat in the chair for the six months and not practiced the physical therapy that went along with it, um, you probably wouldn't be able to walk on that hip. And we could then say, oh, it was because of the injury or it was because of the, the hip replacement versus maybe we weren't doing all we could alongside that injury to help ourselves. Um, 
this is not my passing judgment or saying what we should or shouldn't do or that we can be doing more than we are. I don't know your particular story. Um, but what I can say is that I do believe that time is probably the most integral factor in this. And then alongside that is, is effort. And what I mean by effort is not trying harder, doing more necessarily. Effort is in many ways in Brenza withdrawal kind of trying smarter. And part of that is, you know, is, is hard because trying smarter means and wisdom means we're relying on ourselves um, and we're relying on maybe somewhat of our intuition and listening to our bodies. Well, the problem in benzo withdrawal is we've lost our confidence. We've lost our connection a lot of times to our intuition and we've lost our capacity to really listen to our bodies because our bodies are constantly sending off fireworks and telling us things are grizzly bears when they're mailboxes or neighbors walking down the street. Um, it's sending off mental flares of thoughts and feelings and sensations that are exaggerated. And so it's a very hard time to trust ourselves. And yet it's the most important time to trust ourselves. So we're in this conundrum in many ways. Um, but I do think that it is about balance and it is about, you know, trial and error. It's about knowing you're going to be afraid to try something. Um, and recognizing that, of course, you're going to be afraid. And the fear itself is not something to fear. The fear is is real. We've been burned. We've been injured. We trusted. We did what we were asked. We, we, we took what we were told to take. We came off the way we were told to come off, however, however it goes. Um, and so it's really hard to trust ourselves, and it's hard to trust other people in this. And yet, I think as we begin to engage our lives, we have to be willing to not just feel the discomfort of the symptoms or the sensations, but also feel the discomfort of um, moving into some trust, right? So the opposite, I've heard it said, you know, the opposite of doubt is not certainty. The opposite of doubt is trust. And that, I think, is very key to us in our recovery, right? Because so many of our symptoms in benzo withdrawal have an anxious component to it. Well, a hallmark of all anxious symptoms and sensations is a sense of uncertainty. And so, again, we're, we're, we are in this medical no man's land. We are full of doubt about what to do, how to do it. You know, is it time to go back to work? Can I go back to work? Should I try to leave the house? Should I get in the car and drive myself to the store? Should I try to go to the store again, even though I had a panic attack there last time? Um, you know, you name it. We've been through it, right? And everyone's story is different, but doubt um, is a key component of, of, of I, in many ways, I think benzo withdrawal, and rightly so. That said, the antidote, the opposite of doubt, is not certainty. So it's not, I'm only going to go back to work when I know that I can do 150%. Well, there's no certainty on anything, or I'm only going to try to go and visit my family if I'm certain that I'm not going to have a panic attack. Again, you're not going to get that certainty. So the opposite of doubt is not certainty, it's trust. And it's hard, like I said, because we are distrustful of others and ourselves in this process. And again, rightly so. But I think practice, I always talk about the fact that we get good at what we practice. And I have found this to be true in my own withdrawal process, uh, that I get good at what I practice. If I practice being terrified and ruminating on my obsessive thoughts, okay, um, you know, ruminating is basically a compulsion. The obsession, the obsessive thought is the disturbing thing that's thought that's causing me anxiety. The rumination is the action. It's the verb of what I'm doing. It's the compulsion. And that's a big part of my, um, my journey of benzodiazepine withdrawal is this kind of this this kind of obsessive thinking and I think it's true for many of us whether it's obsessive thinking about am I going to be better am I ever going to heal oh my god what does this mean oh my god what does this symptom mean what right and we have this obsessive thought which causes us anxiety and then we have the rumination which is the compulsion it's the thing that keeps it stuck it's the thing that keeps it around um, I feel like I'm not being very clear on how to get back out there into the world and I think that's part of the issue is there's no really clear cut answer for that. Um, I think one thing I have found is that I've got to go slow and I've got to re-enter slow just like I have to, you know, if I'm going to start a new supplement, I'm not starting taking a whole new supplement. I might start with 
one fifteenth of the dose and do that for a week and then titrate up. And I think in our lives, it's kind of the same way. And it's not so much a testing of the water like, oh God, I went to the store and I felt panicky and so I can't go back to the store. No, I mean, I think we have to be able to continue to try um, with smart effort around the idea of I'm going to be uncomfortable uh, and I'm going to allow myself to be uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, I talk about that beach ball all the time as, you know, as we push it down and it pops us in the face instead of pushing it to the side and allowing it to be there. That's how I envision acclimating back to the world, right, is that we begin to slowly let that beach ball that encapsulates our withdrawal experience, which, in, which you know, is made up of all of our doubt and fears, trauma, um, you know, all the, all the different ways that we've, you know, come to struggle in our withdrawal uh, situations, that beach ball encapsulates all that. And we've got to learn to have a different relationship with that beach ball. Um, we have to learn how to have a different relationship with our minds and our bodies in this as well. And I think that's key. A lot of times we use the word attitude. And in the book that I just wrote, I do use the word attitude a lot. And I don't mean attitude in the way that we often talk about attitude, like just change your attitude or, you know, you have a bad attitude. That's not really what I mean. I'm, I'm really meaning more relationship. Um, you know, what do we have control over in this and what don't we? I don't have control over how I feel in the mornings. I just don't. I don't care. I don't care what I do the night before. I don't care what I do the morning of. My mornings suck, okay? Um, I have not been able to find anything that I can do to make those mornings feel better. The only thing I can do now is I just kind of allow them to be there. And I try not to add a second layer of fear to them. Um, I'm not working right now as a therapist, as many of you know, and, and there's reasons for that. One is I just don't feel like I'm ready to do that. I don't feel like I am consistently um, in a space where I'm able to actually hold the story of another person. Um, and again, consistently. I think there are hours of each day where I could very much do that, but that's not really how therapy works. And I can't really be like, hey, I'm having a good hour. You want to talk? I mean, that's not how therapy works operates and until I'm at a place where um, not so much that I trust my mind but that the way my experience of myself in this withdrawal plays out is a little bit more consistent um, maybe that maybe as my skills improve possibly that would be a help too but I have decided to kind of work I guess in different ways um, doing more writing doing more advocacy doing more awareness um, which allows me to engage with people, but it doesn't put me in a four o'clock on Tuesday time slot because unfortunately, Tuesday at four o'clock, I may just not be in a frame of mind to really be able to sit with another human being in the way I would need to fully do that to feel, you know, ethically responsible as a therapist and how much, uh, you know, um, pride I have in, in being a therapist and the importance of those relationships. So, for whatever, you know, however this is playing out for you, if you've had to leave your job, if you're on a temporary leave, if you're thinking about, God, how do I stay in my job while I'm going through this? And I think what, I think we have to be patient with ourselves. I have found, and again, you may not agree with this, but I have found probably the hard way, I guess, that transparency has served me. Um, when this all first happened several years ago, I fought being very transparent about this process. I had some shame about it. Um, I didn't understand it. Um, I didn't really know what was going on for me on a physiological or psychological level. Um, I had to learn a lot about, um, first of all, grace, <laughs> grace for myself. Um, and, and then I had to learn a lot about what actually was going on in this withdrawal process. And I will say that one of the things I consistently hear not so much about withdrawal, but when I'm studying anxiety, whether that's intrusive thoughts, DPDR, looping racing thoughts, fear and dread, a sense of unease, uh, panic attacks, uh, physical sensations, trouble breathing, swallowing, uh, sensory motor, OCD-ish kind of stuff. Um, any of these things, as I've been studying these and really looking at them, you know, again, um, the antidote to anxiety is irrelevance. Again, that doesn't make our situation irrelevant. It means that we can't 
um, tune into that withdrawal channel, right? And put all of our focus on that and then think that the rest of life is going to somehow find its way into us. Unfortunately, we have to kind of part the foggy clouds and, and go in search of our lives, in search of our relationships that we want to maintain uh, or sustain, jobs that we may or may not want to return to. We have a lot of decisions to make in this, and a lot of times we're just not in a position to feel like we can do that. Um, so I, I think it's a hard question to answer. How do we think about acclimating back into real life? I think it's so idiosyncratic and and... You know, my hope is one day I'm healed enough where I could really work with folks on how to think individually for their set of circumstances, their families, their jobs, their lives, their friends, their sense of self. How do they begin to reacclimate um, after such a blow, uh, depending on, you know, what that looked like for them in their lives? Um, that said, I think in the meantime, as a general rule of thumb, like I said, I think we get good at what we practice. If you feel that you can kind of push yourself a little bit outside of your comfort zone and know that it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, I think doing that, it can be really helpful. The problem is, is that, um, you know, this, this injury that we have, this iatrogenic injury to our central nervous systems, which is what I believe this is, um, is very elusive and, um, and what I mean by that is what I have found is I am not necessarily feeling the impact of a stressor in real time. So for example, I'm in Houston right now visiting family. I live a little ways outside of Houston and I can come in for the weekend and I can get on a lot of the times I can, I can turn on and I can look okay. I know I'm not myself. I, I don't feel half of myself. Um, but I'm able to kind of click into some old gears and some new gears and function. Um, but I may pay for it three or four days later, right? So, you know, our, our bodies do keep the score and our central nervous systems um, are fragile. And we, I think about, the way I think about this is that I, I, me, I, Jennifer, house this nervous system. Let me stop. I'll come back to this. But there was a, I remember years ago, 20 years ago, I'm driving down this freeway in Houston and there's this billboard and it says, if I don't take care of my body, where will I live? And I thought, that's a strange billboard. And it just stuck with me. But I think about that now. Um, I house, house, like in the house, I house this injured nervous system. Okay. It, I, I am, I am responsible for it. And it is on fire <laughs> and it is injured and it's hurting and it's limping along. And I need to walk it and water it and train it and treat it well and do all the right and hydrate it and, and give it nutrition and let it practice building on itself a little bit. But I also have to have a lot of grace and a lot of compassion for myself and a lot of patience um, as we're grappling with this. You know, if you've ever studied anybody with like, for example, traumatic brain injuries, um, these are very, um, many times recoverable injuries, but over a very long period of time, you know, our brains and our central nervous systems, we don't know much about them. First of all, quite frankly, as much as we would like to believe we do, we don't. Um, that said, I have spent the last many years watching and, and, and paying attention to what's working for me, what's working for other people. And I do think our psychology matters. I do think our relationship to our sense of self and our sense of withdrawal matters. But I also think a healthy respect and regard for the fact that we put something in our bodies um, that our bodies did not respond well to. Whether it didn't respond to it when we put it in or it's not responding to it as we take it out, we have to have a healthy respect for the fact that there is a physiology to this. There's not just a psychology to this and or a spirituality to this. This is a multifaceted experience and it drops us to our knees. And so, again, I think that as we seek to re-enter our lives in, in many ways from a transformed state or a semi-transformed state, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got years to go in my taper. Um, I don't plan on my life being completely on hold until that's over. 
that said, I don't think my life's going to look like it did before, which was working, you know, 50, 60 hours a week, um, busy most nights of the week, um, with endless energy, running around, traveling, catching concerts with friends, you know, loving my enormous family and doing all kinds of, I, I don't imagine that necessarily being where I'm going to land, not necessarily just because I can't land there, but also with my nervous system the way that it is and with me being responsible for it, I have to now tend, I have to take care of it differently. I've got new data. Um, and so I've got to take care of this nervous system that's been injured in a, in a little bit of a different way. And so, um, you know, what I would say is if you're, if you're looking to, uh, begin to figure out how to take those first steps back into your life, back into your family, back into a job, maybe what, whatnot, is to go slow and not, not, I don't mean go slow, like in a paranoid way, like I'm going to take a step and then I'm going to check and then I'm going to take two more steps and I'm going to check. Again, that mentality and that approach really breeds anxiety, right? It's no different than, um, I'm going to, you know, have this scary thought, I'm going to count to 10 and then I'm going to see if I still have this scary thought. I mean, that kind of obsessive compulsive kind of nature, um, we can fall easily prey to that and withdraw. And so I'm not saying that when I say go slow and steady, I'm not talking about take a step and check. Oops. Do I still have the symptoms yet? Better go back or oops, take five steps forward. Oops. Didn't check and see if it's still there. You keep checking for the monster under the bed. Guess what? The monster is going to be under the bed. Um, that said, slow and steady is basically a, a mindset and it, it's an attitude. It's a relationship to ourselves that's different. Okay. And again, if that relationship is out of fear and, oh God, I'm going to do this, but oh God, I feel this way, right? That kind of tenuous hesitancy checking kind of piece. Most likely I don't see that's going to work for most of us. Okay. So it, it, but it's, so it's slow and steady with the intent of, I am, I'm in the driver's seat, okay? Um, I'm driving around this injured body, this injured mind, this injured CNS system, and I'm going to prioritize grace in my life with this. And there may be some things that I can do. There may be some things I find I can't do just yet. There may be some things I've needed to change all along. And again, I can't, I can't make a blatant statement of how to do this it would be more of a kind of on an individual basis thinking about, again, you know, kind of your baseline, you know, um, kind of where you were before this injury happened, number one, um, where you're at with your, your, your mindset and your relationship to withdrawal. Um, and so much of, you know, of my book that's coming out soon, The Waiting Room, is about our relationship with ourselves and our relationship to our withdrawal and knowing that we're, what we can and can't change. We can't change that this has happened to us. You know, um, I remember I had a conversation, I think I mentioned this in one of my videos with a, a doctor who now spends his retirement really advocating for us. And he said to me, you know, you're, you, you've become a pickle. And as much as you want to go back to being a cucumber, Jen, it's, you know, you're a pickle. And so he wasn't saying that I couldn't live a good life as a pickle. What he was saying was that, you know, I was changed by this, okay? I could have interpreted that as, oh my God, I'm a pickle for the rest of my life and I'm never going to be a cucumber again and this is awful. I didn't hear it that way. What I heard is that um, this wish for it to go away, my resistance to what had happened um, was not going to help me become a cucumber again. And that really what I needed to do was allow and accept the fact that I had a host of sensations and feelings and thoughts that were, were coming from a place of being pickled. And how did I learn to have a new relationship with myself with that? Um, and, and, and then begin to, um, practice bringing back in parts of life that I wanted back into my picture and adding in new parts of my life that maybe weren't there before, um, on legs that I know are unstable. Okay, so I know I'm walking around um, and I don't have my sea legs most of the time. Um, and there are days that I just want to jump in with both feet. There's days I want to just go right back to work and feel like I can. And then there's days I absolutely know that I can't. Okay, so 
um, again, it, it's hard, and this is where I think we can use each other and sometimes the groups or a couple of friends, maybe a therapist, a benzo coach, people that get it, that can help us from an individual perspective learn the steps we need to take to begin to acclimate back into our lives. Because again, I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Our relationship to ourself, our relationship to our withdrawal, what we've kind of learned from this experience, how we view this experience, um, how much have we already lost in this? Were there any necessary losses in this? Um, what changes do we need to make um, as we house this injured nervous system? And just in the last week, I've had a couple conversations with people where they you know, have been you know, over a year out and uh, feeling a lot better and then kind of pushed themselves and found themselves not feeling you know, feeling like they had a setback. And what I really believe is that in many ways, I think for a lot of us, we feel better before we are, we feel better before I think our nervous systems are, are strong enough to maybe handle some major stressors. You know, for example, Jennifer Lee, if you follow her, she talks about several years into her recovery, um, she was teaching, she was asked to teach a class, I think it was at Stanford, and she goes to teach this class. And that coupled with some other things just toppled her over and she just wasn't ready yet. She was doing much, much better, but she just wasn't ready yet. And so this is where this goes back to my point about transparency is that I try to let anybody in my life know now, whether they want to hear it or not, it's not really about that. It's really about my transparency from my own agency and my own personal ethics that I'm going to say, hey, look, um, I've got this situation, this health situation that is very unpredictable. And I could, um, you know, I could agree to have this meeting with you or I could agree to, you know, be a part of this piece of advocacy work. Um, and I have full intentions of being there and doing that. And I'm looking forward to it. And it's my goal to be there. And I also know that if my body ends up telling me and showing me it can't, that I, I have to listen to that right now. So sometimes that's hard to do, right? When we're working for somebody other than ourselves. I, I work for myself. I have the ability to be my own boss and think like that. Um, so we don't always all have that, have that, that I don't, don't want to say it's necessarily a luxury, but we don't have that situation. And so determining like, oh gosh, I need, I need the money. I need to go back. Um, would it be good for me to go back to work? I get this from people too. Like, wouldn't it be better for me to work? It might, uh, it might not. I, you know, and again, this is where I think if you don't have a good therapist or a benzo coach, I think this, and you're, and you're contemplating some shifts and changes you want to make beginning to do this work. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully one day that'll be a, a role that I can provide for some folks is just a space to be creative and thoughtful about their own reclaiming their lives back after going through this, um, what is traumatic for most of and many of us. So um, this was probably clear as mud, um, but balance, grace, we get good at what we practice, um, but we also have to practice trying smarter, not trying harder. Again, so many of us in this have physiological and psychological symptoms and sensations that um, can, can be also seen, um, even though they're caused by an injury, as anxiety. And again, the... the in, in anxiety, you don't try harder. You don't keep pushing down. You don't keep plowing through. You float, okay? You, you're you still, you're, it's, a, it's a mindset shift. Um, and I'll try to do another video on this because, again, I, I feel like I'm not being very clear, but th that's the that's the take-home point. It's, it's not about do this more, do less of this, do more of this, try harder, push harder, push through that pain. No, it's about trying smarter. Um, it's about, I heard somebody say at one point, trying softer with ourselves um, and, and, and having that grace that allows us to try softer and smarter. And for me, what's key for all of us is really looking at our relationship, um, the, the relationship we have to our withdrawal. How are we narrating our own story of this? Is it a horror story? I get that. I've spent 
lots and lots of months um, maintaining this horror story, okay, and, and narrating a horror story to myself. It felt like one, and I narrated it appropriately, I felt. Um, and then I began to realize, like, maybe I have some say in narrating it differently. And I'm not saying bullshitting myself like you feel fine don't worry about it just go even though your spine's on fire and you're shaking like a leaf and you can't think straight and your thoughts are racing and you neuropathy in your legs and you're getting blurry vision and you want to throw up <laughs> like no I'm not I'm not saying let's ignore our bodies let's not ignore our bodies what I know for myself is that I didn't pay enough attention to my bag of skin in the first 40 some odd years of my life. I took care of myself and I took good care of other people, but I didn't always, um, I didn't always slow down to my own speed of wisdom. And that's, that's our ticket. That's our relationship. That's the relationship piece is slowing down to our own speed of wisdom and beginning to trust again in ourselves and potentially in other people as we begin to think about how do we reacclimate into life. So uh, just some things to think about, and um, I'm happy to answer more questions, and I'm happy to come on and talk a little bit more at some point about what I mean by relationship um, to our minds and relationship to our situations and to our withdrawal. Thanks, guys.